In this video, traders, we're going to look at seven investing quotes or tips, hints from Bernard Baruch. Stay tuned. Hey traders, a very warm welcome to you. So Bernard or Bernard, depending on where you're from in the world, Baruch, I think I pronounced it correctly, so correct me if I'm wrong. He was born in the 1870s, something like that. Very active investor, 1920s, 1930s, around that time. Made a lot of money, millions then, which is probably an awful lot of money now. And then went off to help the US uh, with the world wars and kind of put his efforts into that kind of endeavor. Anyway, he made a lot of money. He's got some ideas on investing. Let's have a look and see what he said about investing that we can perhaps take and use in the current days. And even interesting, you know, look at Jesse Livermore. He was back in the 1930s. This guy around about that sort of era. They're very, very similar. We can take some of the things they see. Even though there's a lot of differences. It's interesting to see how human psychology doesn't change. All right, let's get on to it. Number one, only speculate if you can do it full time. I'm not sure I agree on this one. Let me know your thoughts on that one in the comments section below, guys. I think now with modern technology where we can screen basically a massive amount of charts on a computer in a couple of hours we can do our technical analysis if we're trading we can do our fundamental analysis if we're resting we can leave resting orders pending orders stop loss orders trailing stops all the technology we've got allows us i believe to be able to speculate on a part-time basis and still be relatively successful at it speculate as in investing or trading i don't think you have to be doing it full time now of course when he was investing, I'm sure it was the old ticker tape style. You were making telephone calls, you were sending telegrams, however it was back then. Uh, they definitely wasn't trading on an iPhone, that's for sure. So perhaps to be able to catch the turns, to be able to be there for the intraday price movements and this and that and the other, you probably had to do it full time. So that might be more relevant to the era that he was doing this in. All right, number two, ignore insider info. That's a pretty interesting one because, you know, if you read the book by Jesse Livermore, the old uh, classic that if you're a subscriber, you'll know that I pull this one out quite regularly from my bookshelf, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. He talks about insider info, and that was the worst trade that he did, one of the worst trades that he got persuaded to take this trade on. I can't remember if it was a cotton trade or a wheat trade. One, of the other, one was a good trade, one was a losing trade. I think it was the cotton trade. Supposedly insider info, he took it, ended up being one of his worst ever trades and lost an awful lot of money on it. And it makes a lot of sense because the justification for the trade is that you believe the person is telling you the truth on whatever insider info, whether that is illegal or legal. Let's just forget about the, leg put that to one side, the legality of that at the moment. But if someone is saying insider info and then you're going in and trading on that, you're relying on them to A, be truthful and B, tell you when to get out or C, know that he's not even being duped himself into doing it. So. I think it just makes sense. And of course, from a legal perspective, you don't want to get yourself into trouble and be out of the game uh, because you have been arrested. <laughs> so uh, number three, I think that's a good one. Now, I think I'm going to give this one a half because I don't think that's quite true in these day, this day and age. Let's go on to number three anyway. Number three, don't try to pick tops or bottoms. <laughs> this is interesting, you know, because if you look at PTJ, Paul Tudor Jones on one side, and then you look at guys like him and other real decent traders, even this, in, even in, in today's, uh, in, in the modern day, in the, in the 21st century, they will say exactly the same thing. I don't pick tops or bottoms. But then on the other side, you've got Paul Tudor Jones who says, listen, I make most of my money from taking the, the turning points. I'm very good at picking tops and bottoms. So I think you need to be self-aware of what you're good at and what you're not good at. If you find you're good at finding those turning points, whatever it may be, whatever strategy you use, stick with it. You know, don't just not do it because someone says you shouldn't. But if you're starting out and you're just getting into trading, then perhaps you need to look at not trying to turn, find those turns and look for the trends already and then look to get on board those trends, however you do it. So kind of divert your energy into that as opposed to picking the tops or bottoms, knowing that the majority of people probably don't do so well picking tops or bottoms, but there are some who still do well, if that's kind of makes sense. So I think that's reasonable, good advice. But I would also say if you are, find yourself you've got a little bit of um, an edge doing it, why not stick to it? All right, let's move on. Number four, focus only on a handful of stocks. This makes a lot of sense to me from an investing perspective. You know, if you know your stocks inside, let's say you're very special in the tech sector or oil and gas or pharmaceutical, retail, whatever it may be, you can know what the trends are, the current trending change, trend changes in retail or how competitors are being affected or what you really need to be looking at to see what could potentially move your stocks or what newcomers, you know, just, you know, the industry inside out. So you've got your basket of stocks, however many that may be, whichever 
sector, but the important thing is you know how it moves. So you start to be able to get a good idea of where potentially that stock could go, what stock's good value, what stock's poor value, how hedge funds are positioned in it, how other investors are positioned, what the earnings are like, all that kind of stuff. And you can become a bit more of an expert. And that makes sense to me, even from a trading, coming from a trading perspective, a short term trading perspective, focusing on one or two things, whether that be setups or markets is always a good move. So I think that's a great bit of advice. And number five, cut your losses quickly. You know, there is nobody out there. I'm yet to find anybody. And if there is, let me know who says that you shouldn't cut your losses quickly. If it's the one common theme through everybody who's made seven figures plus in this market, it is that. Cut your losses quickly. I don't know how many times I've stood up here and done a video and I've mentioned this because every single person says it. So the simple thing is try and put it into your trading somehow, guys. Try to make a strategy that allows you to do that. All right. Let's head on to the next one. Number six, always keep a reserve of your funds. Makes perfect sense to me as well. This, if you're investing, allocating all your funds into something means you haven't got any powder left or powder dry to allocate to a really good opportunity that comes around the corner without without end up closing some of the trades you've already got on, so or investments you've already got on. Makes sense, have us funds for a rainy day, whether, whether it means that from a perspective, I think it means that from a perspective of having some ability, some ammunition to go in when a real good investment comes along. I think that's how he, how he pictures, how he, uh, what he means when he's saying that. And it does make sense, doesn't it? If you're fully allocated, you can't strike when something comes along that's really, really good without kind of taking some other stuff off the table. And that makes it a harder decision because not only have you got the decision whether to invest or not in this stock or in this market or in this whatever, it may be but you've also got a secondary decision of is it going to be better performing than the stuff I've got already which is the one I ditch how much do I take out of it the cognitive load becomes maybe too much for you so that makes perfect sense to me as well right final one guys number seven stick to what you know best I think it's very similar to this um, but I guess the sort of side angle for this is if you come from a background of pharmaceuticals you come from a background of tech or whatever it may be maybe you can leverage on that and invest in stocks and in companies that are involved in the sphere that you're familiar with and then use that along with number four so you get get your skill set then you say okay well i'm going to focus on that sector because i'm from that sector i understand that sector that's my skill set and I've, I've, or I've, or I've managed to learn a lot about it because i enjoy that sector and then picking your handful of stocks and then focusing on those and then trying to invest in the ones that you believe are going to give you the best return for your investment. All right, guys, seven of them. Interesting. Good from back then. A lot of them work uh, in this day and age as well. So maybe we can take some of those on board, improve your trading and investing. Take care. See you in the next one. Bye bye.